This lecture is to give you some background on the ideas and work that led up to our modern science of Evo Devo. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning, at least the beginning of our written records about science. Aristotle probably can be considered the first scientist. Um, there are probably other people that did similar things. Their work was lost. It wasn't recorded. So Aristotle is the first one that we have a written record of. And he, although maybe not in exactly our terms today, did things that were similar to modern scientific experiments. He worked with many different fields. He was a philosopher to some extent also uh, in other scientific fields, but he also was interested in biology. He did things such as classifying all living organisms, a very crude classification system. Um, so for instance, for animals, he classified animals into four groups things that walked on land, things that swam in the ocean, things that could fly, and things that dug and uh, burrowed under the earth. So again, a very crude and obviously not very accurate uh, from our modern perspective about the history of organisms, but still it was a beginning. One of the other experiments that he did, which is diagrammed here, was he took chicken eggs, and he knew it took a certain number of days for a chicken egg to hatch from the time it was laid, and so what he did is he broke open chicken eggs, one for each day of the incubation period, and he described what was going on inside the chicken egg. And so really that was the first recorded study of development that we have. And he wrote about it and, and diagrammed, and this is not his specific diagram, but he wrote about it and talked about it. And one of the key concepts that he came out of from this was this idea of epigenesis. So again, this is going back almost 2,000 years, right? And his, well, actually more than 2,000 years, his idea of epigenesis was that the form, the structures that he was seeing in these embryos was coming from unstructured material. So basically the idea that we could generate form and morphology from, in his idea, it was from nothing, right? But maybe if we it give him a little bit of leeway in our modern idea, epigenesis, is that we can take very simple, small molecules and development of organisms taking place inside of a chicken egg or in a womb or in any other developing organism is taking little tiny, small molecules and putting them together in complex ways to make bigger, more complex molecules that then go together to make um, tissue that then make organs, that then make organ systems that are all integrated together to make an organism. So that's the idea of epigenesis. And of course, our modern understanding of developmental biology is pretty much the same thing. Again, with maybe the idea that of he was saying it was coming from nothing into something. Uh, we are saying that it comes from simple uh, molecules to macromolecules building up to organisms. So Aristotle's idea of epigenesis, although fairly early right, and somewhat simplified, was spot on. It was right on the money. So epigenesis is basically what occurs, and now we're going to go all the way down even deeper into the molecules. Well, not today, but eventually, and we'll start looking at the molecules and the genes that build to our final organism. Now, with that, there's one other thing I want to add to this. I missed it on the first lecture, and there was a question on the SLO. If you were struggling with it, uh, that may be a good sign because we didn't really cover it. But I want to talk about what genes are important for EvoDevo. And we're going to start very simply. That's all we're going to do today is give you kind of an overview of generally what genes we're going to be looking at. Okay? So... We are going to classify genes into three categories. The first category we are going to call housekeeping genes. Housekeeping genes are genes that are pretty much necessary in all cells, maybe at different amounts. You know, they're expressed at different levels, but they're critical for cellular function. All cells need them to survive. Okay, and we'll call those housekeeping genes. That's class number one. Class number two, we are going to call tissue specific genes. And these sometimes ha are expressed in a wide array of tissues, not just one tissue, but they're limited to a subcategory of different cell types. They're not expressed in every single cell. So for instance, there are certain digestive enzymes in the human body that are only expressed in the accessory organs to your digestive tract. They're expressed there 
they are excreted, pushed out into your small intestine. So for instance, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the liver, the, these make uh, enzymes that are used in the digestive process. Um, another great example of a tissue-specific one is insulin, right? Insulin is expressed only in the pancreas, although all cells, right? And this is critical for our understanding of how organisms work. All cells that have a genome, basically every cell in your body, maybe minus the red blood cells, which are stripped of the genome prior to their going out and living their short life. But all nucleated cells in your body have the entire genome. So there are insulin genes in your brain. There are insulin genes in your bone cells, right? But they're never used. They're not necessary for those tissues. And so those genes are turned off. They're never expressed. And so that is a very good example of a tissue-specific gene that's only used in one very small set of genes, the islets of Langerhans gene, uh, cells, if you want to be very specific, but only in one tissue in the pancreas, all right? And then our final third class of genes, which are the ones that are important for EvoDevo. So our third class of genes, which is the one we're going to be studying in, we are going to call, colloquially, um, we will call them... Um, Toolkit genes, right? Toolkit genes, or if you want to call them developmental genes, that works fine too. But a toolkit gene is a gene that is used very, very early in development and helps to initiate a particular developmental process. And often there are many toolkit genes that all work together, and we'll look at how that occurs in later chapters, but many toolkit genes that all work together to build an organism. And toolkit genes are really just a handful, maybe a few hundred genes that are all used to build organisms. They do so in a very complex, interconnected way that we're just now beginning to understand and tease apart. Okay, so review. Number one, uh, we've got housekeeping genes that all cells need. Number two, we've got tissue-specific genes that are limited to just a subset of tissues. And then finally, number three, we have these toolkit genes or developmental genes that are the genes that are used for building organisms. And these genes are the um, instruction manual, the toolkit, that's why we call them toolkit genes, that are used to organize simple, small organic molecules into larger molecules that eventually become a living organism. After the Greek Enlightenment period, we have a long period of time when there's not a lot going on in biology. There's some really great things going on of, as far as historically um, that we've now kind of rediscovered, but uh, the Western world for a long time was not aware of what was going on in some of the Eastern parts, like in uh, the Middle East, even into China, there were some things. Some of them were written down, recorded, others were lost forever. But really, we don't get much of an advancement of science as we know it today until after the Middle Ages. And so we're going to uh, jump way ahead here. Uh, 1671, we're still kind of at the beginning of um, the Renaissance and uh, the beginning of kind of a rediscovery of scientific ideals and principles. People are beginning to read the great Greek philosophers and researchers again and start to rediscover and integrate their ideas and build on them. Malpighi was a very famous uh, anatomist, morphologist. Uh, there are many uh, structures in humans and in other organisms that are named after him because he was the first to kind of write about them, discover them, uh, diagram them, and, and discuss them. And as he did this, he wrote a little bit about the development of organisms. He looked at semen, for instance. Uh, this is at the, the outset, the beginning of the, the microscope age, and early microscopes were available. And so he was looking at things under a microscope, and he was able to visualize s sperm in semen, for example. And as he did this, with the limitations and with their, their understanding, um, there were some misconceptions, maybe to be uh, generous. So he wrote about this and, and basically contradicted Aristotle with an idea that he called preformation. So he was certain that when he was looking at sperm that he could see little tiny pre uh, developed humans, well, not even really pre-developed, just tiny, small, maybe needing to do just a little bit of de development inside the sperm, and came up with this idea that was obviously very culturally influenced also, um, that man, the, the, the male, provided the entire structure for the developing uh, children, the embryos, and that uh, females were just incubators. And so this idea of preformation was that the entire structure of a, a living organism was already there, just in small form, and only needed a place to grow. 
Now, obviously, this is silly, and we understand that this is not at all the way it works, but was a widely held belief for many times. I think to some extent, because it reinforced some of the cultural biases of the day, it was you know, readily accepted. You know, there's uh, some preconceptions that were there that this fit well with, and so it was perhaps uh, not tested as rigorously as it could have been. There were limits to what they could test also, but complete misunderstanding, okay? So sometimes this is even called a homunculus, little tiny child, and obviously this has some major problems, right? So if this is the next generation, if it's a male, I guess, um, then are there even tinier little babies inside his developing testes and then in their testes and so on getting smaller and smaller, smaller ad infinitum? That obviously poses some major issues. But they didn't worry about too much of those. So just recognize that preformation, although while, while widely held belief, was really silly based on our modern understanding. That's not obviously what occurs, but was an important uh, phase in our uh, understanding of development and eventually was refuted and realized was wrong and was we went back to the earlier idea of epigenesis. Okay. Now, eventually in this microscope age and through the work of many other people that are not developmental biologists, but these are important ideas we need to build on, we get to the idea of cell theory. And this is one of the central tenets of all biology. In fact, I would argue there are really only two foundations for modern, all of modern biology, cell theory and evolutionary theory. And all of biology is built upon those two uh, basic foundations. Okay? You could maybe throw in some other things or argue with me if you want, but really everything at one extent or another relies on both of those. Okay? So cell theory, of course, very simple, right? All living organisms are made up of cells. At a minimum, a single cell for things like amoeba, you know, bacteria, all uh, prokaryotes are single cellular, as some eukaryotes are, but some cells are made, or some organisms are made up of many, many cells. But if it's a living organism, it has cells. And then number two, the only way that we can generate new cells is from previously existing cells. So cells come from other cells. That should be, that's going to bother me. Let's fix that. Okay, cells come from other living cells. And so this is the idea of, this is our modern idea and our modern understanding of life. And so if we're going to make a complex organism from simple beginnings, we need to start with simple cells. We start with an egg and a sperm. And of course, we know today those fuse together to make a single genome, half mother, half father, actually a little bit more mother than father because of the mitochondria, but that's a, a small component. And we end up with a new cell, right? The uh, fertilized egg that eventually develops into the embryo and becomes our large complex organism. And we're going to be looking at how that occurs. So cells come from other living cells. And so it's important when we're looking at multicellular organisms that we make a distinction between germ cells, right, which are eggs and sperm in animals or um, ova and um, pollen in plants. There are some other names for them depending on the organism you're looking at, but we'll focus on animals, so eggs and sperm versus those somatic cells. And somatic cells make up the body, but have a very uh, finite, limited lifespan. And hopefully I'm not going to give you some existential crisis here, but realize that the vast, vast majority of the cells in your body are going to die within the next 100 years. Okay, Maybe if we have some advancements in technology, we'd live a little longer than that, but it seems to be a pretty hard limit on the ultimate you know, lifespan of humans. So within 100 years or so, all of your somatic cells will be gone. However, germ cells, a very small percentage of them, but have the potential for essentially immortality, right? Because an egg can be fertilized, a sperm can fertilize an egg. Those can then go on to develop into a fully formed organism. And as long as those organisms are successfully reproducing generation after generation, they basically have infinite uh, potential reproduction. So germ cells essentially can and do have the potential to live forever. And if we want to look at that the other way, right, vice versa, we can take both somatic cells, and although they are now at a dead end, we can trace the history of that somatic cell going all the way back to that fertilized egg and sperm, going all the way back to uh, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, all living cells today, whether they're somatic cells or germ cells, can trace their history back all the way back through all of the ancestors, even going back to the first early, you know, even very different looking ancestors, all the way back to the first uh, common 
cells that make that were the ancestors of all living organisms. So there is an unbroken this number two here, right? The uh, logical conclusion of number two is that all cells today can trace an unbroken history all the way back to the first ancestral cells, the uh, most recent common ancestor of all living organisms. So just be aware of those concepts and how this links together all life on Earth and that somatic cells now in um, individual um, multicellular organisms have a very brief limited history. So know the difference between germ cells and somatic cells. So now that we understand this, we have to figure out how we go from these simple cells to these very, very complex organisms. And we're going to spend a good amount of time looking at this in Unit 1.3. So I'm just going to give you a quick outline. In 1924, a set of breakthrough experiments performed by primarily two researchers, Spiemann and Mangold, uh, again, 1920s, they looked at early developing amphibians, salamanders. And they begin to describe in simple terms, because remember, pre-1924, we still don't know what the genetic material is. People are beginning to look at macromolecules, at carbohydrates, at proteins, at nucleic acids, but they still don't know which one is the instruction manual. We don't have really any good idea of genetics. This is pre uh, our rediscovery of Mendel, so we don't even really have a good understanding of Mendelian genetics, although he had written about it in the 1800s, had largely been uh, looked aside, and we're just beginning at this point to about on that verge of rediscovering Mendel's idea of genetics. So really this was breakthrough material, but not in the same level of our understanding of genetics today. And so they did things like split an embryo at a certain stage and then look to see what the result was. And what they found was if they did it at a very early stage, that it often had very little impact on total development. That they could split an embryo very early on and both halves of that embryo would still develop into fully formed organisms. However, if they did it partially a little bit later, after some cellular development had occurred, they would end up with di very different outcomes. And so they came up with one basic idea we're going to introduce now, and then in 1.3 we'll go into it in more detail. And this is the ideal idea of induction. And this was the idea that there was something, and remember at this time they didn't know what that something was, but there was something that could begin to program cells for a very specific fate. So cells could be programmed, for instance, to be nerve cells. And that if they interrupted development after that induction had occurred, we would end up with some very different results. If they interrupted it or changed it beforehand, often there would be very little outcome. And this is essentially how monozygotic or identical twins are formed, right? If the early embryo splits early enough before induction occurs, those uh, two different bundles of cells can both then recover and go on to become fully formed organisms, right? However, if it occurs after induction occurs, if we were to split the cell afterwards, we might end up with a um, conjoined twin, for instance, if it's a partial split, right? Or if it occurs much, much later, the embryo can't survive, right? So if you take an, an embryo that's already well into the phases of introduction and you split it in half, there's just not enough uh, of the viable material there to go on to fully form. You'd have a head and a tail or a left half and a right half of the, of the salamander and those embryos would be non-viable and would die. So very different before and after results, and it's this key idea of induction. And again, they didn't know what the inducer was, what, what caused that change. Of course, today we know that it's DNA and the expression of that DNA that makes different outcomes. And so we will look at it, and, and maybe even more specifically, the RNA, right, mRNAs that are coming from the genes that are inducing different cells down different developmental pathways. So I had termed this uh, thing the inducer, but they actually called it an organizer. So an organizer was, again, some kind of unknown. They didn't know what exactly it was. They, at this time, probably had an idea it was some sort of a molecule, maybe even the idea of a biological macromolecule. But there's some sort of organizer that would initiate this induction that would cause different cells to go down different pathways. So you should know what induction is, right? It's that moving towards a very specific cell fate and that there is a initiating uh, component that we are going to call an organizer. And they even begin to do things like they would take uh, a little bit of material out of one cell, 
and put it onto another cell and see what happens, right? And so what they found out was if they did a, um, and we'll look at these in detail, if they did a graft, if they took a little chunk of cells from a developing embryo from the head and put it on the side of a different embryo, that they would end up with two heads. And so they realized that, oh, there's something in that, those group of cells that we are grafting onto this other one that are acting as an organizer and inducing cells that normally would have a fate to maybe become a leg or inducing them to become a head. And of course, if you do that, you end up with problems and conjoined uh, uh, twin embryos and all sorts of issues, okay? But just be aware of that um, concept and those ideas. Now, there in classical development, there are all sorts of, of key ideas. And we're gonna look at, I just wanna define these very quickly. These are, we'll talk about some of them in more detail, but others we're just gonna kind of just take for, for granted that you know. So I'm gonna define each of these. You can look them up if you want. They're rather simple and, and straightforward. Gametogenesis, of course, is a process of making gametes. This is pre-development, but it is making eggs and sperm. Fertilization is the process of fusing those gametes together. That should be easy, straightforward. Cleavage is a simple uh, term for cellular division at early stages, where we get a single fertilized egg turns into two, then four, and then eight, and so on. So these are the very, very early stages of embryonic development. The later stages, a little bit later, we call it a zygote, and that's sometimes used fairly widely. Uh, zygotes can be then classified into different forms. A morula is a very early stage of, we're still in that cleavage stage, a baby, you can think of it as a solid ball of cells, maybe going up to a couple hundred cells. And eventually, as cells migrate and move around, we get the blastula. And the blastula is the early, you, you may want to think of it as the early fetus or the early developing embryo, where we start to see form, at least in simple stages. The blastula is a hollow ball of cells we're now seeing something rather than just a, a cluster of cells, they begin to migrate or move, um, transfer around the edges. So morula, solid ball of cells. Blastula is a later stage. It is a hollow ball of cells. Gastrulation, as the name implies, is the early stages of forming the gastrointestinal tract. So we get cell migration moving in and making either the mouth or the anus first, depending on which type of animal you are. In the deuterostomes, it's the anus first. In the protostomes, the mouth gets formed first. But we both in both, we get the gastrulation tract. A little later, we get the nerve tract forming, the brain and the um, central nervous system. That's called neurulation. And then finally, in the later stages, we get, very generally, organogenesis, um, formation of the organs. Again, this is basically an order. You have gametes made first, there's fertilization occurs, cleavage, which forms the early zygote, goes through stages, the morula, the blastula, the gastrulation, we start to see even more structure, more patterning of the, of the nerve system, and then finally, organogenesis. And again, all of this occurs prim pretty much in the first one-third of embryonic development. In all organisms, it's a little different, but roughly the first third of development, we get all of the, uh, the vast majority of morphology is created. And after that first third of development, a lot of it is just simply growth and maybe final uh, patterning of, of a few systems. All right, so stepping back just a little bit, um, some other important ideas that go into Evo Devo. This is classic development. Heckel was a very famous uh, biologist. He was an anatomist, uh, wrote a lot, drew a lot. He came up with this idea uh, that amongst vertebrates, right, tetrapod vertebrates, um, and even going down into the fish, that early stages of development were very, very similar. And he exaggerated a little bit. It was a little bit of a controversy. He, he was drawing, didn't have pho photographs uh, that could be taken of these small developing embryos at the time. But so he drew them as he saw them and probably exaggerated a little bit. So these are actually a little more similar in his drawings than they are in real life. But the idea is still valid that early on developing vertebrates look very similar to one another. So an early developing human has these little structures that look like gill pouches and in other organisms develop into gills, but in humans they become reworked into our pharynx. Humans have a very large postanal tail in early stages. So we see some of these things and he came up with this key idea and his idea was kind of condensed into a, a very simple statement. I'll actually write it here just because it's big fancy words. If you ever want to sound really um, uh, fancy, I guess, a little bit stuck up at a party, you can say this. And his idea was that ontogeny, 
which is a fancy term for embryogenesis, the development of the embryo. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So say that five times fast. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You don't really have to, but the idea is that you can kind of see a little bit of the phylogenetic history of organisms in these stages of embryonic development. That at an early stage, humans look a little bit like uh, earlier, uh, simpler organisms, right? And that we kind of go through some of our history, at least, is recorded and maintained in our developmental sequence. And it's a kind of very broad idea, but useful. Um, this is a link down here if you're interested in uh, Heckel, in addition to being a scientist, was a really quite good artist. And so he has some amazing um, uh, drawings. I think, let's double check, I think this is still a valid link. If not, I'll find it and, and update it. Um, but these are, uh, this was a website that I found a few years ago um, that has some high resolution images of his artwork. Yeah, it's not there. Um, I'll find it and update it for you, but you don't need to do that. It's just kind of cool. He has some really, really dramatic, amazing images. Um, so take a look at those if you're interested. Uh, he was interested in all sorts of complexity and, and not just development, but just complexity of, of organisms in general. All right, of course we need to include Mendel in this because our modern understanding of that organizer, right, those things that can induce things down different pathways, of course, are rooted in the genes that are found in the cells. And so we need to understand genetics. Mendel in the mid to late 1800s was working on genetics and began to figure out the, the foundation, the, the important uh, beginnings of how we pass genetic material from one generation to the next. And although he didn't know what that material was, so he didn't know anything about DNA, right? This is pre-understanding of macromolecules, DNA and, and amino acids and carbohydrates, didn't know really anything about that. But he was able to figure out the mechanism, at least, of, of, of trait uh, passing on from one generation to the next. And so you've all done basic genetics. We're not going to get into it. You, we're not going to review it here in this class. But I do want you to understand that Mendel is the beginning of that. And then I also want you to understand that Mendel's ideas, although way ahead of their time and a breakthrough, were ignored completely. And that's partially because he was printing, he was publishing in German in a small um, um, journal in the German language. Um, he was not actively corresponding with other scientists, which was really important at the day, writing letters, going to meetings, those sorts of things. He, he was kind of a lone wolf, but doing amazing work. And so his ideas were largely lost, but then rediscovered in the early to mid-1900s. And people begin to then say, look at his work and apply it to fruit flies and other organisms and realize that he was really an amazing researcher and way ahead of his time. Okay, so just realize that Mendel is the modern father, the father of modern genetics, but was not given credit until almost, you know, like 70, 80 years after his work was done. And so this led to our modern uh, rediscovery of uh, the basis of genetics. And so I want to look at some key experiments that were steps along the way to our making the link between Mendel's ideas and the actual molecules that uh, were at the base of that Mendelian inheritance. Now today, of course, we know it's DNA. It's the genes that are in our cells. And those genes have different versions that we call alleles. And all those get together to make up our modern uh, genetic uh, history of all living organisms. So this is a gr an experiment that was conducted in the Griffith lab. We'll just call it the Griffith experiment in 1928. And you may have done this before. If so, great. I want you to um, review it. And this came up with this idea that there can be a transforming agent. Now realize this transforming agent, as Griffith called it, is very, very similar to an organizer. But we're not really looking at development here. He used a much simpler system. He used bacteria. But to some extent, we can make an analogy between this transforming agent in bacteria and an organizer that can induce different cellular histories in a more complex organism. So let's outline this experiment, and then hopefully you can see why I'm making this connection between the transforming agent and an organizer. So there was a certain type of bacteria that were very virulent. If you injected them into... Uh, 
a, a laboratory mouse, it would die. Isn't this great? You flip the image upside down, you have a dead mouse. But anyway, uh, so dangerous bacteria kill a mouse. There was a very closely related strain that was completely safe. If you injected that into the mouse, no negative impact at all. Right? So that's the key setup. So they then started to do a set of experiments. They heat killed the dangerous bacteria, you know, boil it, heat it up to it for a, a period of time, inject that into the mouse, and sure enough, oh, the mouse can survive. So we can make a, and this, you know, of course, they kind of knew this at the time. This was a fairly well accepted due to the work of um, Pasteur and other scientists, you know, we realized that we could heat kill cells and then, then they would no longer be dangerous, right? So essentially we don't have any living cells after this heat process. And so that's a completely safe material. But this is the key breakthrough, the key experiment for the Griffith one, is that they took the safe cells, they mixed them with the heat killed dangerous cells, right, that are also uh, uh, safe, right? So they take the avirulent ones. These should be red. I don't know why they made them red up here. But uh, the avirulent cells mixed with the safe heat-killed cells, and then suddenly the mouse would die again if they gave these guys enough time together. So there was something in these heat-killed cells that was still there that could be transferred to the safe cells and make them the virulent form, make them dangerous. And they called this the transforming agent. They didn't know what it was. They were not sure. Now, today we know that it's a little piece of DNA, something akin to a plasma. This was the first transformation experiment where they were taking genetic material, albeit in a very crude kind of form that they just uh, hold everything in the bacteria heat kill, mixed it with the avirulent ones, a very small amount of those that could then take on that DNA from the heat kill dangerous cells, and they themselves could be transformed into a dangerous cell. And so today we call this a transformation experiment. We can do it much more efficiently today. Okay. Avery et al. did a similar set of experiments uh, where they were using a virus. So this is again about a decade or two later. Um, and they did a set of experiments where they were able to radioactively label different components of a virus. So Griffith really didn't know what the transforming agent was. By Avery at all time, they had basically uh, narrowed it down. They knew that carbohydrates were, were not variable enough to be it. They knew that fats, lipids, right, weren't really going to be a good candidate. So they had, they had uh, limited it down to either amino acids, proteins, or nucleic acids, RNA or DNA. And so they didn't know which it was, but um, they, they were doing these sets of experiments. And so what they did was Avery et al. looked at um, bacteriophages. These are bacteria that can, or sorry, viruses that can infect bacteria. And so they were essentially transforming these bacteria into little virus uh, um, factories, making more viruses. But they didn't know whether it was the protein coat of the virus or the um, nucleic acid inside the virus that was doing that. So what they did was they took two different types of, or, well, the same type. They started with the same type of virus. They separated into two groups. In one of the group, they radioactively labeled the protein. In the other group, they radioactively labeled the nucleic acid. And then they looked to see which one was transferred to the bacteria in infection. And they found that in the one with the radioactive labeled protein, there was no transfer into the bacteria. But the radioactive labeled amino acid was then transferred into the bacteria, and that's what caused them to become different. So Avery et al. experiments established that it is nucleic acids, RNA and DNA, that are the key transforming agent, the genetic material, if you will. And that wasn't established till they did these sets of experiments in 1944. Okay, Around the same time, we've got people that are beginning to rediscover Dent Mendel's ideas, apply them to fruit flies. Mueller was kind of the, the godfather of all modern uh, fruit fly genetics, and then many hundreds of people came from uh, his work and their work and, and so on. So just realize you don't really need to know the name Mueller. These other names you should know and, and be able to equate them with the experiments. But just know there's a rediscovery of genetics, and it's applied first to fruit flies and then again eventually beyond. In the 1950s, after we have established that DNA is the genetic material that we really want to look at. We have Ra Ra Watson and Crick and Rosamond also. I'm going to include her in this, um, and I'll give you a little bit of background. Rosamond um, 
does not pike i think does not get the credit that she deserves um let me just pull this up here sorry it's rosalind franklin so really we should say franklin watson and crick here and i'm gonna make sure that we give her credit um, and i'm i'm a key uh example of this because when I went through biology and learned it, I only learned about Watson and Crick um, and they did not give Franklin the credit that she deserved. So really the three of these, Watson and Crick got the uh, uh, Nobel Prize, Franklin was not discovered. So here's how this worked. People knew that DNA was the molecule for genetic material but they did not know anything about its structure. They wanted to discover its structure and the key to doing that at the time was um, a process that is called x-ray crystallography. Basically, you take a highly purified sample of a solution and then you freeze it and you make it form crystals, you fracture it, you run an x-ray through it, and then you see the patterns of that x-ray. And it still blows my mind that they can do this, but that was the process that they were doing it. Watson and Crick were kind of the uh, brains behind figuring it out, but the data itself was generated by Franklin. Um, Rosalind Franklin generated these x-ray crystallography. She couldn't quite uh, tease them apart. She took them to her advisor. She was like a postdoc at the time, basically. Um, and her advisor sent them on to Watson and Crick. And so without that data, they would have never been able to elucidate the, the Nobel Prize winning structure of DNA. So Rosalind Franklin, uh, James Watson, and I forgot Crick's first name. Anyway, Franklin, Watson, and Crick. Just know that those three together elucidated and figured out the structure of DNA. Key advancement, right? We needed to know that and understand that for, for our understanding of Evo Devo. Uh, the last one that I'm going to look at is um, a kind of a next step on to what we were looking at with those Griffith experiments. And this is the idea that we can essentially create a, our own plasmid, that we can take whatever we want to, insert it into a circular piece of DNA, and use that DNA to transform bacteria. And this is called a recombinant DNA you know, because we're, we're combining two different bits of DNA. So we could take a gene out of a fruit fly, for instance, stick it into a plasmid and take that fruit fly gene and get it into a bacterium. And once it's into that bacterium, there are all sorts of tools. We can amplify it by just letting the bacteria reproduce. All sorts of really incredible, valuable tools that we can use by doing this transformation. So that's our last kind of key um, conceptual experiment, we're going to look at some of the modern techniques in our next lecture that allow us to do modern Evo Devo.